good day, everybody. Welcome here to A Thousand Words or Less. This is a new show we got here on the channel. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe, by the way. Uh, but here on this show, what uh, the plan is to do is to bring on other authors, so not just myself, but bring other folks in here and they can share some of their work. The only catch is it has to be a thousand words or less. Uh, they'll get to uh, read it aloud for y'all and we'll discuss uh, the work itself as well as uh, any other projects they have going on. And I'm really excited today to introduce our first guest here on the show. This is Ross Hardy. Ross Hardy and I uh, go back a ways. We go back to Mercer University days. Go Bears. Uh, go Bears. Uh, and if you've ever uh, looked in the back of my books where I uh, say that if you like this book, you should check out some other books. Uh, Ross Hardy uh, is part of what we call, uh, he and I call the Drinklings. Uh, and his wonderful book, Cafe Noir, is always in the back of my books. You should absolutely check it out. And uh, But without further ado, let's uh, introduce Ross Hardy in here. Ross, how are you doing today? Uh, very, very well. How about yourself, Bryce? I'm doing fantastic. Uh, as we're filming this, uh, about a week and a half ahead of when it's going to air, I'm on break, so I'm doing fantastic. Oh, nice. Uh, nice. Always good. Uh, the, the perks of being an educator. Uh, but... Uh, Ross, uh, you are reading an excerpt actually from Cafe Noir uh, That's right. for us. Um, before, uh, before we get into that, uh, tell the, our viewers a little bit about yourself. Well, um, I, I don't like to say I'm give or take 30. <laughs> so I, I will say that I've turned 30 at least once. And uh, I'm not going to, I'm not prepared to go into any more specifics about that. Um, like you said, uh, we met each other at Mercy University. I managed to get myself an English degree. I'm not entirely sure how, and I'm not entirely sure why either. Uh, but it served me well enough to, uh, you know, I've, I've kind of kicked around here and there. Um, my first job out of college was um, kind of the stereotypical uh, English major thing. I worked at Starbucks, which, um, as, as you will hear in the, the coming minutes, might have something to do with uh, the first, my first self-published, uh, first, I say first, but only uh, self-published novel. Um, but I've been, I've lived in uh, here in Georgia my whole life. Uh, I don't know, how, Bryce, I don't know how specific you're getting. I don't want to get doxxed. Like, I don't want to, like, necessarily say, like, the geographic location right now. We're somewhere below the Mason-Dixon line. I'll say that. Well, you, can, you can go back, well, you can redact what I said. We'll keep the, uh, we'll, we'll, we can keep the locations uh, secret from the, uh, from the authorities. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Just, uh, we, we can't, the channel can't get too big because then they'll know, then they'll, they'll know where to, where to find exactly. us. Exactly. You know, this book is just that dangerous. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, you know, not a, <laughs> not a superbly interesting person, especially during, uh, during quarantine, you know, nobody's really going out and doing anything that I'm doing less things that I, that I always did, which was a very small number to begin with. Uh, but Bryce, I'm I'm very pleased uh, about the the work you've been doing on our channel. I'm very happy to uh, be the inaugural guest. Hey, uh, we I'm I'm so happy to ha have you here for that. Uh, and before I get you to read your excerpt, um, is there anything you want to tell the the folks about uh, what you're about to read uh, before we get started? Yeah, um, Cafe Noir was a novel that I. I, I knocked out over the course of about 18 months uh, after I'd worked at Starbucks for a little while. And it's basically my psychic regurgitation of what Starbucks was like and what uh, coffee culture was like. And it was, it, the, the way I described it at the time was, okay, you know how when people come into Starbucks or a coffee shop at six in the morning and they act like coffee is the most important thing in the world, and they act like they'll kill you if they don't get it. Well, what if it was the most important thing in the world? And what if they would kill you if they couldn't get it? Uh, so then I just took down all of my uh, William Gibson books and all of my Raymond Chandler books and kind of put those in a word processor. And the slurry that came out was Cafe Noir. And I, I like to describe it as a hyper-violent satire of coffee and consumerism. So wow. it's a, kind of a, a science fiction-y, uh, Blade Runner-esque, um, very much a, like a neuromancer, Raymond Chandler mystery. Um, and the seagulls talk. The seagulls can talk a little bit. They, they're not, they can swear. <laughs> and I don't think I've got any, I don't think I've got anything blue in this. I don't want to like have 
you have to put like an explicit tag or anything, but I think everything is uh, the first the first uh, 950 words, I think, are, uh, are free of any profanity. Well, that, that answers uh, the next question I was going to ask before we started because uh, it's a thousand words or less, so I had to yeah. see where you're at. So we're about 950. All right. Yeah, give or take, give or take. I think it's like 946, but we'll, I, I might throw a couple of, put a little bit of English on it. So I'll, uh, you know, might, we'll give or 50. take. Give or yeah, take. there we go. Um, all right. Well, uh, if you got nothing else you, you have to add now, we'll talk more obviously after you're done, yeah. done reading, but if you want to go ahead and start. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, so the, the whole story is it's a, uh, it's about a coffee company, a, a mega corporation that's the most powerful corporation in the world. It's called Crater's Coffee. It's spelled with a K, uh, Crater and Coffee are spelled with a K. I don't remember why. Uh, I just remember thinking that was a good idea. And then it's just, that doesn't really, you don't need to know that for uh, to, to enjoy it, but it's, I want you to know it and now you know it. So it, it sounds like the kind of corporate hipster, uh, fake hipster stuff. That, yeah, that yeah. Back in, back when I wrote this in, tw in 2014, that was a big thing. People were, people were all about switching letters around. So this it, is um, Cafe Noir. Chapter One. Every crater location on the continent, in the world, really, is supposed to look familiar. Not identical. Crater knew from experience that Marx didn't react well to the appearance of corporate homogenization. If every store has the same floor plan, people complain about soulless corporations, no room for individuality. If every store is different, you lose that brand identity that it takes so long to cultivate. So you want every store to be familiar, like walking into a new church or getting into a new model car. You know where everything is, you understand its purpose, but you still have that rush of discovery. A crater location should feel like the embassy of a nation to which you should feel privileged to belong. And that's what a good brand does best anyway. It's to wrench a subculture out of the ground by brute force. It's elegant in its brutality almost, the way it slams everything into the mold and discards whatever it doesn't fit. It's appropriate that a corporate symbol is called a logo from the Greek, logos, the word, because in corporations, all things are made. They are their words, their identities. They shine in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Logos transcend language, shape, and color, merging with thousands of hours of PR and focus testing to blur the lines between the signifier and the signified. You could be on the Martian colony or the Russian Empire. You might not speak a word of anything except pigeon Haitian market slang, but when you saw the interlocking double Ks, you knew where to go to get a couple hundred milligrams of caffeine. My store, Crater's Coffee, number 8630, was no different in its difference. Its doors thrown open to everyone, provided they refrained from panhandling or otherwise offending the delicate sensibilities of the type of refined people who were willing to go into a frothing psychotic fit if the poor kid behind the counter was a half second too slow. The blue filters on the lights cast a calm ambience. They weren't as good at discouraging outbursts as the auto turrets had been, but corporate said those sent the wrong message. 8630's unique feature, a locally upcycled genuine wood table, sat in a position of casual prominence, a collection of chairs arranged to suggest that a small group of students, perhaps, or local businessmen had just concluded a brief, friendly meeting. Anyone who attempted to sit at the unique feature would, of course, be politely but firmly informed that it was for display purposes only. The whole store smelled like coffee, carefully modulated by air quality sensors. If the proportion of odor particles dropped too low, a small, fragrant puff was released into the vents. No crater location had coffee grounds in the air since before the war. Particulate matter in the air was too dangerous, and it was reasoned dangerous to Marx's poor respiratory health. Coffee grounds got everywhere, under your nails, in your hair, on your clothes. You couldn't walk without slipping, no matter what kind of non-skid shoes you bought. Espresso grounds were too fine. They coated the floor in a layer of nearly imperceptible and virtually frictionless dust. Pre-war bean slingers with nearly permanent stains on their fingers, the ones before Crater, didn't wear closed-toed shoes just to keep the grounds out. 
you were guaranteed to break a toe or worse when you slipped the first time. Not if, when. The smell of coffee was joined by toasting bread, a practical effect as opposed to olfactory sleight of hand. We were about to switch over to the lunch menu, but for now, the oven was busily cranking out the crater cakes we served for breakfast. The cakes were part of Crater's twofold compromise on food. The company had resisted getting into food service for quite some time, but eventually the numbers were impossible to ignore. The simple fact was, people have been eating their pastries with their coffee for so long that the act, the ritual of getting their caffeine felt incomplete without something to eat. This despite the fact that the levels of caffeine dealt with sent appetite plummeting, you can't outfight psychology. So, Crater assembled dozens of the country's leading celebrity chefs, culinary experts, and public relations firms. In keeping with their desire to stay ahead of the curve, their initial idea was the most futuristic food product they could manufacture, a brightly colored, nutrient-rich paste made primarily of soybeans and whey protein that could be ingested through a straw. The paste was rolled out in a titanic ad campaign timed to coincide with Crater's fifth anniversary. The test markets were disastrous. Even when Crater introduced the cracker, a gluten-free rice wafer, no one accepted the paste. So they were quietly retired and Crater's PR men went back to the drawing board, surveying thousands of frequent and lapsed Crater customers. What food, they asked, is most in keeping with Crater's corporate mandate to be the most advanced culinary brand in the world? After six months, the PR men determined that it wasn't paste or dehydrated pills that the modern mindset most associated with science fiction, it was noodles. Crater's contracted chefs shrugged at the news and tossed together a recipe for glass noodles, fried tofu, and onions in a soy broth that could be stored indefinitely. The public was overjoyed, and sales of Crater's noodles were a perennial moneymaker. But nobody wanted noodles for breakfast, and the problem kicked off again. By now, thoroughly tired of the hassle of trying to reinvent the breakfast wheel, the chefs and PR men spent an afternoon kicking around ideas before settling on a trio of small tarts. One had garlic, one had walnuts, and the other had currants. People seemed satisfied until the food schism, but corporate doesn't like people to talk about that. All right. Well, uh, it gets, uh, the, the world of coffee is absolutely, uh, for from having read this book myself and absolutely loving it, uh, oh, the uh, the the uh, the wit that you start to applying to what was clearly uh, a job that uh, you both enjoyed and got and got old uh, yes. with all at the same time. Yeah, um, quite uh, is uh, is great. And and, uh, and for the, those of y'all who have not read any uh, anything by Ross before. Uh, Ross has a very natural wit, um, uh, and he says no. He says he has to work at it, but it, it pretty. It, it sounds gone like, to dusk. It it sounds like the wit that comes out when you and I just talk normally. So I'm pretty sure it's natural. Um, but oh, so you're, uh, you're not tell, you're not telling them about the uh, the 80 page script that I wrote at uh, at workshops before this. We're, we're we're not talking about that one. Oh, we can talk about it if you want. <laughs> <laughs> um but uh the uh the book itself has, has been out for uh, for a few years now though uh ross though, where can they find uh find the uh a copy of this book um the easiest uh place is probably going to be amazon you can throw a couple of pennies into jeff bezos's pocket uh just i think i'm still the first result um if you search for Cafe Noir, Ross Hardy. If you just search for Cafe Noir, I'm like on the 300th page. But Cafe Noir, Ross Hardy, you can get a, um, a physical copy. I think they're $11 and then you can get a Kindle for uh, 99 cents, I believe. Yeah. Um, that's probably going to be the easiest uh, easiest place to find it. Okay. Well, um, well, Ross, since I wanted to talk a little, uh, before we go, I want to talk a little bit more about the, the process uh, of writing this book for you. Yeah. Um, you said it took you about, uh, say about 18 months. Yeah, about a year and a half. About a year and a half. Um, you have, uh, you and I, I have talked, uh, in, uh, over dinner, uh, before about the differences in, in how, how you and I approach writing. Um, and for, for our viewers, um, 
18 months to produce an, uh, a, a decent sized novel about about close to 300 pages. And it's it's 60,000 words. It uh, ends up being about 260 pages in the uh, in the print. Yeah. Um, that's a pretty quick time frame for uh, for writing a book. For most people, I mean, we're not uh, you know most of us aren't Ian Fleming who can uh, you know uh, pop out a novel in about a month and a half right. every every year. Um, so, what's your process as, as you uh, dealt with this novel and any in any work that you uh, that you try and yeah. uh, tackle? The you you mentioned you were going to ask a question something like this, and I, I have been thinking about it a lot because it's really it's really tricky. But the best way I've figured out to articulate it would be: uh, you write what you want to read. I write, or I wrote Cafe Noir mostly to amuse myself. I wrote jokes that only I would get, and I was fortunate enough that other people got them as well. And I just thought, what would be what's funny here? What's cool? And I just wrote to impress myself and it seemed to work it, it's that was what because if, if I didn't enjoy doing it I wouldn't have done it um there had to be something that was fun and that was exciting and the best way to do that was to write things that I thought were interesting and then the other angle I look at it is if you do a good enough job of figuring out who these people are in this world that you've built, then you can pick them up and put them in a situation and you'll know how they'll respond. And then all you have to do is write that down. So it's, it's, it's less like a, um, it's like a documentary. It's like you're watching these people that you've invented do things. So uh, in this book, I've got the, the hero is a gentleman named Argo Jones, and I just sat down and sort of brainstormed, like, who is this guy? And I would think, oh, you know, is he, a, is he big and tough? And then I realized, no, that doesn't seem right. That's not, not who he is. And, you know, he's a, you know, just kind of a scrappy dude. He's a young guy. And then as, I, as that started to develop, then I could move him like a chess piece. And I was like, okay, I know who this guy is. I know what he's about. What would he do if this happened? And then I just wrote that down. So it's people, there are, there are a lot of resources about world building and, and how to develop your characters. But the only thing I found that would work is get to know the, the people that you're writing about and the world that they inhabit. And then you don't have to invent anything. You just have to watch what they do. Uh, no, that's... Uh... Uh, that's great advice, and uh, actually, uh, you've echoed some things that I've, for those of y'all who haven't checked it out yet, I've got another show here on the channel called The Writer's Desk, where I'm going to be slowly giving advice um, uh, about writing, and you're, you're going to hear some, uh, some things I'm going to be giving advice on that uh, is going to echo exactly uh, what Ross has been saying here. Um, I think the most important thing he said is write what you want to read. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you and I are both, uh, it's the reason we call ourselves the Drinklings. Uh, you and I are, are both big fans of C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, and I actually was getting ready for a video that will be up next month. Um, and uh, on The Hobbit, it'll be uh, part of our, the Inklings Review's uh, first book we're going to do is, is going to be on The Hobbit. And I found this quote from C.S. Lewis after he had just read The Hobbit. And he said, Tolkien has just written the book that uh, he and I and, and his friend who he's talking to, Arthur Greaves, said, the three of us, this is the kind of stuff we always wanted to read when we were kids. Yeah, exactly. That's what he, and so that's what he wrote. Yeah. And so it's, uh, it's uh, it seems like obvious advice. Right. Um, but I think so many people get caught up in wanting to write what other people will find acceptable. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and people will find people will find it acceptable that you wrote what you wanted to write and they'll enjoy it more because it was genuine and true. Yeah. Uh, and that's, if, if I can real quick plug the, the one book that is more useful to anybody who wants to learn how to write than any other book. It, it's better than Strunk and White. It's better than anything is Lois Lowry's Dear Mr. Henshaw. 
because that is the ultimate point is where the little kid, the best advice he gets is you, you didn't write something that you thought other people would read and you didn't write something that you thought um, that was like anybody, anything anybody else had written. You wrote something that was real, that was true and that you wanted to read. And that's, you know, you, you dress it up as much as you want, but really that's the best advice any, any writer can give another one. No, I, I uh, absolutely agree. I'm, and I'm glad we were, uh, I'm glad we're here on our first episode. We came around to, uh, to that point. Uh, now, Ross, uh, and I, do you have any other projects in the works at the moment, uh, either uh, stories or uh or novels or, or YouTube channels or anything like that. No, we need to plug no I, I don't have anything to plug. Um, I, I wrote, um, I wrote a comic book. This seems to be inverted. I don't know if that's actually. No, it's, it should show up fine. Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. All right. Um, I'm not very well versed in the Zooms. I wrote, a, I wrote an all ages comic book called The Library of Alexandria. It was illustrated by a very talented young woman named Audrey Carruthers. That is available on, uh, Comixology or Amazon. I believe it's 99 cents. Um, I'll, put, I'll it, put a link for it in the description on, on the video. Um, and, you know, there are there are things here and there that I'm kicking around, but um, unfortunately, I don't have anything. Uh, I don't have any follow-ups to announce. I don't have any news to break. Uh, I, I wish it could be uh, a little bit more exciting for you, Bryce, for your inaugural episode, but hey, no, well, I've, I've got to say that right now I'm not working on anything. Well, if nothing else, you uh, you can write a, a short story in a thousand words less and come back on the show. Noted. Uh, and, we'll, and, we'll get into talk, and we'll get into talking about the comic book a little bit more that, uh, when you do. Yeah, hell yeah. All right. All right. Well, Ross, thank you so much for coming up on the show and joining me today. Um, it's been a, a real pleasure, as it always is, talking with you. And maybe the Thanks, next sir. time will be enough through this pandemic that we can sit down here in the in the library and do the whole thing here instead of over Zoom. Inshallah. All right. Well, Ross, uh, as, as long as I don't knock, knock my camera over. I was about to say, uh, is there an earthquake? What's going on? Yeah, yeah, I should I just, talk. I'm, I'm the one who's been knocking my camera around all, all night. So, <laughs> Hey, I was due for one. Uh, well, everybody, thank you for joining us here on Thousand Words Less. Big thank you to Ross Hardy for being our, the first guest on our first episode here. Uh, next month, we'll be uh, getting to talk with another friend of ours, another drinkling, uh, Mary Catherine Wiley. Oh, uh, nice. And so we are uh, going to have a great show for you next time. So make sure you come back and uh, visit with us again here in the library next month. Uh, so everyone have a wonderful day, and we'll see you again next time.